Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, today I'm going to be talking to you guys about BQplot, a library we built when I was at Bloomberg. Um, and uh, we're, uh, we're it's basically, so uh, if you want to follow along with this in code, uh, the link right there under my GitHub, by Gotham 2017, you'll find all of the notebooks that we're showing here. So you shouldn't have a problem to access them and run them. And the install instructions are in the readme. So everything should be quite in order. Um, OK. So what is BQplot? Um, so BQplot is an interactive plotting library for the Jupyter Notebook, is what the slide says. <laughs> and uh, predictably, if I say this to people, uh, the response is, uh, why? Uh, we have Matplotlib. We have Seaborn. There's something called the Altair. Uh, and there's even something called Bokeh. So why should I kind of learn another API? Why should I waste my time with it? And the answer is, well, uh, not displaying in a PDF, but uh, essentially we allow uh, the demos that we're going to show you are really concise and really very uh, pretty well-written Python code that allows you to generate arbitrarily complex, um, pretty much uh, interactive web applications directly in the notebook. Um, one of the big things that that gives us is, uh, well, not just the notebook, now Jupyter Lab, if you guys know what that is. Um, what that means is that from Python, we can generate a fully interactive web application that's controlled by Python. So you essentially never see a single line of JavaScript code in building New York Times-esque uh, interactive visualizations. Or, uh, and the way we did that is we use what's called the IPy widgets framework. Um, so IPy widgets are Jupyter's native uh, widgets, which are sliders, buttons, text boxes, labels, drop-down menus. But they're also a framework to build JavaScript objects that Python can communicate with and can communicate with Python. Um, and I'm going to show you what that means. But just for reference, that means that any other library that's built on top of this, whether it's a 3D visualization library, a uh, mapping library, for, or a really uh, uh, Martin Brettles is IPy Volume, which is a kind of a very sophisticated uh, 3D WebGL rendering library. All of those can easily be plugged and played with BQplot with uh, basically zero effort. Um, so bidirectional communication, what does that mean and why does that help you? Um, so I'm hoping that. Uh, this demo will kind of convince you it's really useful. Um, so just as a starter, uh, we, we have two different APIs. Typically, when you hear talks by the people from Altair, they distinguish kind of imperative APIs from declarative APIs. So PyPlot, the standard matplotlib plt.plot, would be an imperative API. Uh, we have both, so we, we decided to be kind of agnostic about it. And uh, we produced both an imperative and a declarative API that kind of play very well with each other. Um, because, well, they're built on the same thing. So, uh, but yeah, so just as a starter, if you have some data which is generated by NumPy or it's a list of data or whatever, you can just import BQplot um, from BQplot, import PyPlot as PLT. Um, you do your standard thing, you do PLT.scatter, exactly like Matplotlib. Um, the only difference is you have to do PLT.show and you have uh, a plot. Um, it's three lines of code. The difference between matplotlib and everything else is we're actually a fully interactive web application. Huh? Um, you can reset it, ban it, do whatever you want. That's, an, that's a web element living in your browser um, at any given point of time. You can even save it. It's going to download that for PNG. Anyone know I can stop this? That's really annoying. Um, uh, what did I mean by bidirectional communication? Well, it means Python communicates with JavaScript, and JavaScript communicates with Python. So when I mean Python computes with JavaScript, it means, so I declared this object, plt.scatter, and I named it scatter. So if I do scatter has many attributes, x, y, uh, color. So let's assume I change y. I'm not regenerating that plot. It's the original plot that's changing live, because all I'm doing is efficiently rebinding the data to that original object. So I can do this continuously, and it's going to give me a just re-rendering the original plot. Um, if I like, if I want to make it really funky, I can always add an animation duration, so a number, of, amount of time the animation has to do, uh, amount of time the animation spends. So then when you move it, you really see the plots actually live changing. Um, 
Okay, uh, so that, that holds for everything. It holds for the colors. So if I change the color, if I change the marker type, so that becomes a diamond. Um, so that's kind of the Python communicating with JavaScript. I'm changing an attribute, and that's changing a plot for me. Uh, the other side is JavaScript communicating with Python. So now imagine if I have a Python function, say, foo, um, and I, it just prints hello world for right now, but it could do pretty much anything you want. What I can say is that for the object scatter, whenever y is changed, observe foo. That means call the function foo whenever y is changed. So I can set enable move to be true, and what that lets me do is pick a point and move it. And when I move that point, I'm changing its y value, and that's going to cause that function to be called. So. <laughs> I'm a pretty enthusiastic card. Usually it's like, oh, what? <laughs> uh, so yes, yeah, so if, uh, if we do it the other way, um, if we, we try to see, so it also tells you what's being changed. So now I'm printing exactly what it's sending to you. So it's going to tell you the Y attribute was changed, the old values are this, and the new values are that. So you can respond to specific things that if you build an application in this that the user does entirely in Python. You can use that function to correspondingly change your plot. It gives you a bunch of data. What you do with that data is, uh, yeah, it's totally dependent on the function, what we call a callback over here. Um, okay, so I said there were two APIs. There's an imperative and a declarative. That was the imperative API. That's, it's not totally substitutable for your matplotlib code because we don't agree with all the different design aspects of matplotlib but it's kind of close. Um, the other uh, API is really an object-oriented API. This is for people who want to do kind of really funky visualizations. Um, so in that, we respect what's called the grammar of graphics. It's, it's a taxonomy, I don't know how to say this. Uh, it's a way to construct a plot as a sequence of objects. So you define the plot as many different things that are composed into a, like a painting, which is called a figure or a canvas. And uh, the mo most important thing out of that is what's called a scale. The scale is what maps the range of your data into the range of the plot. So Wikiplot exposes each thing as an object. So we define a scale. We define a scatter, which is the scatter plot. Um, we define axes. So these are now, when you do this uh, in the object-oriented format, you can see that you can change arbitrary things about it. Um, and then we define a figure, which is the canvas on which we draw everything. And when we do that, you get figure. Um, the good thing about that is you, since Beekeeplot is grammar graphics oriented, pretty much everything can have a scale associated with it. So in this case, if we have some data that we randomly generate, say zeros and ones, a day you bought and sold a stock or something like that, you can just import a color scale and associate that with your scatter chart. And what that's going to do is color the chart according to the data. So exactly similar to Matplotlib. By the way, all of this can be done in Pyplot too. It's just a question of which API do you prefer. And this one, usually people who do really funky stuff prefer this because they pre prefer to have an arbitrary degree of control over their plots. Um, yeah, so you, if, uh, as you can guess, if two plots or two different types of charts share the same scale, they can belong on the same chart. And if you guess that, you're absolutely right. Um, all, you, all you have to do to put many different plots in a single chart is make sure the different plots share the same scale. And that allows you to kind of generate yeah, really funky D3-esque things like this. Um, we also have uh, yeah, of, of a really wide variety of different plots. So if you want to do something like uh, generate a map of the US with the election results, you can also do that, and then you can add a tooltip. So we have a tooltip object, and it says take the fields from the plot, that's ID, name, and color, and label them something like country code, county, county code, county name, and the winner for that particular county. Um, set the tooltip of your map, which is defined uh, somewhere around here. Uh, yeah, plt.geo. So here it's mixing the object-oriented APIs with that. What that's going to do for you is uh, generate a full US map um, with each county having, so when you hover over the county, you can see who's won it. So that's kind of a 538-esque plot in eight lines of Python code, basically. Um, so that it's definitely pretty useful because it means that even if you're doing research, 
its minimum overhead into generating these interactive plots to better explore your data. Um, the really cool thing that uh, I, even the Matplotlib guys are trying to incorporate now is that any widget can be a tooltip. So if I change the tooltip to be another figure, I can put an entire line chart inside of a figure. So you can imagine a good exercise would be to listen to which country is being hovered over and change that to be some time series associated with that country. So it's pretty fast. It should be one more line of code to this, and you should be good. Uh, three more lines of code. Uh, we also have the notion of selections. So what that means is within a plot, you have a tri attribute called selected. Uh, so right now I just clicked on a thing and it changed it and you never saw what got selected. But if I, if I do set the selected and unselected style of a plot, what that's going to mean is it's going to be well aware of which one I'm selecting. Um, I can also bind a function to selected. So whenever people select one point or multiple, it's going to, select, it's going to let them know. You, you will be aware in Python when they select a point. So you can always develop a GUI around that. Um, you can also have uh, selectors which are not just clicking, so you can have something like a brush and have a callback and it's going to tell you exactly what's being selected at any given point. Um, you can also, one of the main things that I said was you can mix BQplot with any uh, IPython widget. Um, so to start, we, we take a simple example where we mix it with, uh, well, First, first we show how we, how we might use it. So traditionally, if we want to, let's say, teach someone linear regression, we're going to show them a set of points, and we're going to draw a line through it. I always draw the wrong line, but uh, here, what uh, one way to teach them that is uh, to teach them, say, the effect of outliers on the linear regression. You can start by moving points. You can see that that doesn't change it much. But if you really stretch a point, it's going to complete a single point is going to affect the linear regression kind of severely. So it's, uh, that's some ways people use it to educate uh, on different, I don't know, machine learning topics. Um, you, combining it with the iPy widgets always makes for a better educational experience. So here we have your classic polynomial regression. Uh, if you go to any Coursera course, this is the canonical definition of what overfitting is. Uh, I mean, this is the example that's used to demonstrate overfitting. So here, using the slider, we can control the order of the polynomial. Um, as you see that it, as the number, as the order grows, you kind of start, quote unquote, overfitting. Um, so yeah, that definitely mixing the two always provides for a better interactive experience. Um, okay, uh, so uh, as I mentioned, you can use these to make kind of full scale web applications. So one of the most famous ones is uh, Mike Postock's uh, Health and Wealth of Nations which puts income and uh, life expectancy on the two axes, and the size of the country is the population. So you really get to see for each country which direction it's going. But keep in mind here, you don't know which country is which. So in BQplot, you can build a whole thing in, kind of, uh, in Python. So no JavaScript here. Just read your data, clean it. Um, you have that in Pandas. Uh, define some functions to let you access the data. Create a tooltip, a label. Um, different scales. So keep in mind that uh, this is on a log scale because I guess at one some of the, uh, I mean, basically the data kind of grows exponentially. To put it on a linear plot, we need to have, uh, we need to put it on a log scale. Um, so you define your scales, your axes, your scatters, and put it all together in a figure. You, in, if you don't like this text slider, which I don't, you can do it as a year slider, but we do have a text slider from what I remember in IPy widgets. And finally, when you bind all of that together, you get exactly the same plot purely generated in Python. Cool thing, you can now hover and see which country is which and what path it took in the space of in income and life expectancy. If you want to control the years, uh, you can always move, move the slider. And that's going to hopefully move your years. Uh, no? Did I? Yeah, OK. So the slider is going to let you animate the plot. Um, you can always, there's a play button in IPy widgets, so you can always just hit play and watch the thing become a fully animated uh, plot. Um, so this is the part where we usually show a lot of flashy examples, and uh, Shri's a lot better than me at that, so I'm going to let him do it. So uh, 
Go ahead, Shri. <laughs> Thanks, Ruth. And uh, 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 how are we doing on time? Five more minutes? Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, I thought I had more time, but uh, then I'll go um, fast through the, uh, through the different things. So I'll start off with, you know that there are a lot of mobile companies and everybody has their own patents and they're constantly talks of like patent infringement. And so this is an infographic from Thomson Reuters. It's trying to uh, like show who is basically suing whom. And, <laughs> and so, but uh, if you look at this, it's, it's good, I guess, but then you can get much information. So as a replacement for this, uh, basically what we have in D3, Mike Bostock did, is a force-directed graph. So uh, essentially here, each node in the graph is a, sorry. Each node in the graph uh, is a company, and then it shows you uh, what are the companies that are sued by it, and what are the companies that are suing it. So this, you can do the same thing in BQplot, like very easily. So this is just the data part of it, just, and then this is, so we have, uh, so we have a lot of high-level abstractions which you can use to build like complex applications which are very commonly used. So here what we have is exactly the same. Each company is, uh, is viewing it, but uh, we have to put interactivity. That is what differentiates us. So if I hover over a company, then it just highlights the, company, the, uh, the suits in which this company is involved. So you can get a much better picture of what is going on. Okay, then, uh, so, yeah, I've, I'll have to go really quick into this, so I'll be skipping over a lot of details. Uh, you can uh, talk to us later after the talk uh, when, uh, if you want to go into more details. So this is the standard MNIST data set, uh, which is basically digits, and then you're trying to identify what digit it is. So uh, as Dhruv said, you can combine uh, BQplot plots with uh, with IPy widgets, so you can combine it with a slider. You can just inspect what your data is, uh, like both in train and test. And then there is a very famous uh, dimension reduction and visualization technique called T-SNE. So uh, it's T stochastic neighborhood embedding. So it's basically reducing your dimensions to just two. And here you see that there is like some structure. Uh, like all the pink uh, points here are corresponding to number six and they're in a nice cluster here. But you want, you see that there is at least one blue point here which it is confusing for a six and then you can like kind of understand basically if you're compressing the data just to two dimensions, uh, what kind of points are uh, getting confused and you can use this to help your modeling. So next, uh, yeah, we'll go over a financial example. So uh, all of you have heard many times that basically in crises, the correlation between the different stocks increases. So here on the left, we have the price series of the Dow Jones. On the right, uh, we have the correlation matrix. So the darker the red, the more correlated they are. So uh, we have, like along with Brush, we have like few our own selectors which will help you go through the data really fast and get an understanding of what is going on. So basically here you can just move from side to side and if you want to zoom in on a particular interval, uh, you can like, so basically if you move the mouse horizontally, it's controlling the midpoint of the interval. If you move the mouse vertically, it's con controlling the width. And here you can see that if you focus on periods where the market really uh, tanked, you see that the correlation across the different assets is, uh, is much higher than normal. So next, I think I have like two minutes, so. Um, so this is the last session, so you can take a little bit more time. I mean, the next ah, session, okay, but. sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Mm, thanks for, so I'll probably take a couple of minutes more. So uh, I, I don't know how many of you attended the previous talk, it was on uh, ConMet. So since uh, deep learning and neural nets are being used in a lot of places, so we have tools which you can use to understand what your model is doing and how you want to improve it. And there are a lot of parameters that you can tune. So you would ideally want tools which help you identify which one uh, you want to tune and like have some intuition of what the model is doing. So basically this is on, uh, on a data set from Kaggle. So it is uh, the delinquency data set. So essentially, we're trying to predict 
who is going to be delinquent based on a bunch of attributes like uh, what is their income, how many dependents they have, et cetera, et cetera. So here uh, on the X, so we are training a neural net model built in Keras. So it's a fairly simple neural net. So it's just like three or four layers. Yeah, it's just three layers, uh, 20, 10, and one with just a small dropout for regularization. And yeah, this is my network, and I want to see how the performance, how it is performing. And so on the X, we have the e epoch, and you see that this graph is actually animating, the numbers are increasing. So we see that the train and test uh, error, uh, in this case, are pretty close. So at least we are not overfitting, and uh, basically if we are overfitting, we can probably reduce the learning rate, et cetera. So then what you can also do is, uh, so for like small neural nets, you can like visualize the entire architecture. And one thing you might want to look at, especially when you're training, is look at how the gradients are evolving over time. So this is the number of epochs. And you can see basically by hovering over each node what the gradients are like at each node. So suppose if a node you see that the gradients are very low, then basically, yeah, that node is essentially in a saturated region or something is wrong with it. And then you get to identify what is going on with your network and also like you can tune your network much easier by using these tools. And then you can construct, oh, sorry. And you can also like, but this is just one thing, you can customize it since it's essentially a Python function you're calling. So you can also look at what is the histogram of activations for this node. So this is like a slightly more uh, involved computation. So you basically see that everything is, so this was a ta hyperbolic tangent layer and everything is like kind of saturated towards the upper limit one. So probably the gradient is not flowing back enough and you can tune your model better. So yeah, that is for it for the demo. I'll go back, sorry. Mm. Um, where's the slides? And I, uh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, so check, check out our GitHub repo and uh, you can, there are a lot of things that you can use. You can check out the examples and uh, yeah, we're open for questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, can you talk about deployment tool sensor? What options are there for deploying these? Uh, sure. So um, basically this is, uh, this runs uh, using the notebook as a front end. So you can also use it to deploy it on your own web server, like uh, by using the tools in the notebook itself uh, to just okay, open just, it. Just, just, just click. Ah, okay. Sorry, I'm really bad at using the <laughs> Mac. So uh, if, you, uh, if you click on widgets and if you say embed widgets, so essentially it it's gives you, one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it gives you the entire JavaScript and then you can paste it in your, yeah, so this is the entire JavaScript that you need and you can essentially paste it in your HTML, uh, in your HTML script and then it can render on your web page. And so you also have interactivity for free with this, like all the interactivity which relies only on JavaScript, you can directly get uh, by putting this in your HTML. But if you have Python uh, interactivity as well, you can do that as well. and. Yep, you can talk to us afterwards and I can tell you how to do that. Is it, is it practical to display like a lot of text? So for example, you're doing like NLP, mm -hmm. and you wanted to like uh, brush over it and see like what rules triggered something to be extracted. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and so I did that once, but uh, in general you should visualize if you're doing some kind of word embedding and you are projecting it, you should visualize it as a set of points and color the points in a certain way. Because in general, if you if imagine if you just did a kind of word cloud with say the Disney embeddings as a kind of simple example, you don't really read much. <laughs> I mean, it's a bit hard. So it's better to have your colors kind of indicate which, say, type of token or whatever they are, and then uh, then go from there on the hover. Well, I was talking about slightly different application. Let's say you're trying to produce um, readings for documents, and you're extracting things which are relevant for 
some other expert to look at, and then they're looking at them, and they want to say, well, why did you pick this? So then you could mouse over it, and then they could go and see. Well, mouse over what? You'd have to have a representation. Uh, well, this, I mean, that, I don't, I don't know what text would mean here in that case, then. Well, I guess what I'm, it's very simple. I'm just saying, can you just, can you plot, instead of graphical objects, could you plot fonts? So well, we do have a label that allows you to plot text, and but... Then you could uh, the text, and then from there... Yeah, so we, we do have an object called label that lets you plot a text at a certain x and y. Yeah. It would be a bit uh, kind of hacking it to use it to over to underlay a PDF document over it. You can do it. It's a fully flexible graphic environment. So uh, I definitely, if you do it, I'm, I'm curious to see it. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, you should, yeah, the exercise is to really port the code here. Uh, so, yeah, we don't have a mapping from block back to Python code yet. So we, you would have to write it, but it's, as I point out, it's typically 100 times simpler, in my opinion, to do it in, in PQplot than it is to do it in D3. Yeah. Uh, and also, like, we have coverage of most of the common plots that are, that are out there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we are always adding new, so... Uh, if you really need something new which you want to add, and uh, so you can always raise raise an issue, and uh, like one of us will most likely add it if it is like frequently used. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks. I'm not sure if I understood this correctly, but uh, you said that you were able to embed these in, in websites, uh -huh. and uh, you know, if that's the case, I was wondering if you could limit those to the public because to run the Python. You have to be running like Jupyter Hub, and each one in yeah. turn needs to be. There needs to be one for each user, I would think. So, are there caching strategies? Are there like challenges in scaling this if you actually embed it? Yeah, if you want Python callbacks, there will be. If so, there are two types of callbacks. There's things that's happening on the JavaScript, and things that you do on Python in interactions. If you just want the JavaScript, it's super simple. If you want the Python and the JavaScript, it's addressed. It gets into the complexities. So, that with just the JavaScript. You separate from the Jupyter and yeah. not be running it. Yeah. You can just put it in an HTML page, literally just copy paste it and it's good to go. So if you just want to have an, a plot with a tooltip, let's say that the best example I use is the map. If you ever want to have just this, so if you just want to paste this map into a web page, everything that this map is doing, zoom, pan, whatever, is in JavaScript. So if you ever embed this, you have Nate Silver's you know, favored maps in whatever color scheme and whatever, with whatever interactivity, straight in JavaScript. But if you want to do something like this, where your pi, where your where Python is recomputing the polynomial uh, coefficients as you move the slider, that's harder. Do you just extract JavaScript from your browser? Is there a more? Yeah, that's uh, yeah, it's kind of, well, not exactly. There's an embedding framework that's written for iPy widgets, so it works. So IPy widgets did most of this work. So they use, so since BQplot is also a JavaScript library, they construct the objects from that, and it's it's a bit complicated. Yeah. Uh, is there like an easy way to have the pod surrender in the browser, but do all your Python work in the terminal? Yeah, so that is uh, essentially what the other. Uh, no, uh, that, but by the way, if you do if you do do that, there's one thing in uh, that's called uh, Jupyter Lab. It has the notion of merit output. So without getting into the complexities of embedding, in, uh, you might want to look at Jupyter Labs merit output because that's really, uh, it's close to what you're thinking about. Yeah. yeah. So you can separate out your Python code, which is the kernel. You can essentially run like commands on So a different window can be showing the output, and a uh, different window can have the code. All right, so mm -hmm. thank you very much, guys. If you